The following program is a production of Ozarks Public Television. The Lady Bear history is the best that Mill America has to offer. I really think that it started with, you know, that that group of ladies that got together and decided they wanted women's basketball to be great. We wanted to teach our players about life through the wonderful game of basketball. Yeah, I think we always had a bigger dream in mind, a bigger goal in mind than maybe what some teams do. Having that dream created all the success that we had. <laughs> Dr. Wayne McKinney, um, you know, is a big advocate of women's sports. And uh, he was interested in hiring coaches. He was interested in um, producing a product for women's sports. And I wanted to coach. And when I got the position here, I was coaching, I hired to coach field hockey, basketball, and softball. It, it almost kind of evolved in that uh, a lot of students uh, just wanted to play basketball. No scholarships, they're all just come to play. And that's the way we started. You certainly didn't have uh, players out in the high schools and junior high schools that you could draw on for talent on it. So it was pretty much taking your physical education class and, and uh, working with them. And I put a sign up in the locker room around the campus, we're gonna have tryouts and girls came. Coach Reba Sims uh, seen a big young kid and realized that I had a lot of hype, raw talent, and she took me on. So I not only played softball, I started in the fall playing basketball at SMS. My athletes were multifaceted. They were not, they didn't play year round one sport. Mary Phil Dwight, uh, she was our point guard, and, and Karen Bethurm and Pam Magram and Janet Cutberth and Glenda Bond. We all played softball together, a lot of us did. So we were two sport athletes. Of course, Mary Phil was a three sport athlete and we all kind of, you know, it was kind of a clicky thing. You know, all the PE majors tried to stay together because we were the ones that were making up the athletic programs. We also didn't have uh, funds to support uh, the travel. We didn't have funds to support uh, purchasing uniforms. You know, we had the same number in basketball and softball. We also used that for both sports. And uh, I don't know, we had um, a one white jersey that had burgundy letters, and we had these red looking shorts that didn't match, but we used those in basketball and softball, and the jerseys were so tight fitting, your teammates had to pull on them. So once we washed them, of course we had to wash them, uh, we could put them back on. Uh, travel, it was just unreal. We would have to take individual cars. Um, we would arrive before a game, maybe, maybe an hour. Um, we would eat at only fast food restaurants. They thought I had stock in McDonald's because we ate at McDonald's a lot because that was the cheapest place to eat. We liked McDonald's. <laughs> and uh, so after the game, when I'd take the kids to McDonald's and they'd be eating, um, then I'd have to get on the phone and call everything in. And to uh, Springfield newspaper, invariably I had to spell every name that I gave them. They never recognized from the last game we played, and it could have been just last night. I don't know if I was always getting different people or they just didn't uh, care enough to remember some of the players on the team, but I would spell every name, tell them everything, and we'd still come out with a little write-up that was barely this big and just said the very basics. There were no headlines. You know, back then, it's like everything else. She had to be the statistician. You know, it was very difficult at that time. for They didn't have people that would just take tons of stats all the time. We had people on the bench that wasn't playing was keeping stats. And if you, you know, if I fouled out, I was keeping stats. So, you know, I could see how that would be an awesome task for any coach, because looking now today, they have them like 10. You know, they'll have media sitting there and they'll have news conferences. We didn't have news conferences. We just got, we showered and then we got in the cars and drove back. We would drive to Manhattan, Kansas in one day, 
play the game and then drive back. We'd get back at three or four in the morning and the kids were expected to be in class the next morning as well as I was expected to teach. I know the women's basketball you would see in practice, oh, was there a game tonight? And you know, I was involved with the program, but that's just kind of how, how it went. Didn't have any, uh, any big crowds of a particular type. And most of the time there might be 10 to 12 people and, uh, but they were allowed 10 to 12 people. Parents. Our fans were parents. We were young kids. You know, I came to SMS when I was 17, enrolled in school, and, you know, I had no idea what was going on. I just wanted to play. I was very competitive. And, uh, you know, she was a young coach at that time, too. And I got paid a fat $7,000 to come to this university and do all that. And I was tickled to death. I mean, it was my dream to come and coach and be allowed to coach. That's what I wanted to do. You know, I, I think that's a, a history thing. You know, the players need to look at that and say, this is where it started. You know, the fact that they loved what they were doing, they weren't getting scholarships, and, and uh, it, it was fun. And uh, the camaraderie, uh, the, you know, the friendships from the teams that they played on. Uh, the humble beginnings were very, very true because they made lots of sacrifices, but they, they wouldn't give up. They wanted, they knew, they knew what was coming, but it may be on down the road, which it was several years. But again, we're there because of the efforts of a lot of people. AIW was going Division One. Our program had been successful in competing with uh, the big schools, the large schools. At the time, the the division was large schools and small schools and we were competed in the large school and when they went division one because we'd been so successful uh, we wanted all of our programs to go to division one and they permitted gymnastics and uh, uh, softball and i believe volleyball to go to division one and the others had to remain division two you know the other schools the k-states the ku's the um, illinois states the southern illinois we played southern Southern Illinois quite a bit also in our scheduling. Um, they were putting basketball up here and we were down here with everybody else and we could not keep up. And so I felt I was just banging my head against the wall and we weren't making any progress and I thought I need to get out. It wasn't good for me and it, I didn't think it was good for the program. And so um, Marty Gasser came in. Marty Gasser was coaching an AAU team of college age girls invited me to play. I started playing with them, uh, got to know Marty pretty well, got to know the girls, liked the style of basketball, and spent quite a bit of time thinking, you know, I don't know anything about UMKC really, and I sure do like it here. So called UMKC, it was a hard phone call, got out of my contract with them, and then signed with SMS. And one of the lures for SMS was, was that time when they were getting ready to go Division I. After our proposal to the Board of Regents at the time to go Division I, uh, there was a committee formed to see if the men should go Division I, and which eventually they did, which took all the programs into Division I. Marty was a player's coach. Uh, she knew how to work you hard, but she also knew that you were human and could joke around and have fun. She really related to the players and they, they to her, and she did a wonderful job, uh, but uh, she didn't want the recruiting and the tension or the pressure, I should say, of a Division One program. She had been down in Texas, was part of, uh, I think it was Stephen F. Austin Real high-powered program, got to fly everywhere. So I think she was a good next step for SMS, but she was a lot more serious than Marty. I think the chemistry would go through a transition. You know, at the beginning of the year, there were always new people coming in, so we would try and help the new folks coming in. Um, people from all over the country started coming in, which I think that was a change for some of the people that had been there longer than me. Lynn Struberg, um, Oh boy, Paula Busher, Cindy Hoffman, um, Sharon Zeilman, Kelly Mago and I played together for a while. I played with her my freshman year, and so, you know, she was kind of a big name coming in that she was an intimidating player to get to play with, because I kind of knew about her, was she was the All-American on the team. 
Um, but she was a neat, a neat gal to play with, was very down to earth, was a hard worker, um, and was very serious about the game always. I think because I'm pretty stubborn. I didn't like getting beat. I still don't like getting beat. And I think I just wanted to be the best. You know, I think the freshman class that I came in with, um, we were kind of the goofballs at the time, and it, you know, it was a game, and, um, and it was a great game, but it really, I wanted it always to be fun, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed it, and when I got into it, I got into it, and would cheer for myself sometimes. I think that would have to be against Bradley uh, when I went 16 for 16 on the floor, and I don't think I really realized you know, that that was going on at the time until afterwards. My freshman year, you know, you could sit there on the bench and kind of count the people in the stands if you weren't paying attention to the ball game. I played in front of more people at Glendale than I did at SMS. No, early on, I mean, they, I can remember Mary Jo Lynn calling me, begging me to, to send somebody over, and they just weren't drawing anybody, and I had only had so many people. If we at, at KY3 covered a women's basketball game, it was lip service at the very best, and, and by and large, they weren't covered. Yeah, we put their scores on the air. We felt that uh, we weren't uh, progressing as we wanted the program to, and so we felt we needed some help, and uh, who better than to ask business and professional women to come help, you know, the student athlete. Dr. Wynn comes to you and says, I have an idea and, and I need some help. No one can say no to her. Uh, the Go Card, we were trying to promote the program and getting people in the stands. And, and the idea behind it was that if you showed that card, then you got a whole bunch of stuff, which we didn't have very much to give at the time. So that got you a seat and got you popcorn at halftime and, and that sort of thing. But she also brought in uh, Jody Conrad from the University of Texas and said, come in here and help me figure out how I can duplicate what you did at Texas. That was a part of uh, trying to keep the Fast Break Club energized and uh, we brought in Jody to speak to them and to encourage them and uh, uh, keep them working. As much as anything it was, you know, you guys can do this. It's been done, you can do it, and, and this is the time to get it started. And after that we just didn't look back. We just, we knew it could happen and we just kept going. We went from having to knock on doors and hand out schedule cards and go to the 7-Eleven and ask if we could leave our schedule cards and put a poster up to not having to do any of that, that there was a good group of people that just came to support us no matter what. Well, you know, the, the idea was that uh, <clears throat> if, if we could get the young people here, their parents would come. And uh, if we could get the parents here, we were going to make a, the event such an event they'd have so much fun that uh, they would keep coming. Uh, she knows, I've told this story umpteen times, but we, we were having to turn in revenue and make what we could, and, and I finally said, Dr. Wynn, is anybody paying to come to the games? I joked with her about it, and uh, it was half serious. Well, they, they weren't getting any money anyway, you know, unless we promoted on them. And, um, you know, I, I think they, they didn't realize where we were headed with it. One father said to me, that uh, he got him free to the game, but it cost him $16 at concessions, <laughs> you know. And at the time, Athletics got the money from the concessions, so that was okay. I mean, she was the profit involved because payoff it certainly did because it got him in that habit of wanting to come. In many ways, I think she's always been the greatest fan of Lady Bear basketball. I actually had called Joanne Rutherford at the University of Missouri about jobs, and Joanne had told me that there was an assistant job in Southwest Missouri State under Valerie Goodwin. And our philosophy was the head coach needed to bring in their own assistants, so uh, she brought Cheryl in. That's when I met her, as she became my assistant coach. Cheryl was always a real stickler, and she definitely ran us uh, hard. She left the program uh, to go to K-State as an assistant. And so after I had accepted the Kansas State assistant job, Valerie took the Oklahoma job. I talked to the head coach at Kansas State at the time by Matilda, by the name of Matilda Mossman, 
said, Coach, who had been at Arkansas, I said, Coach, I understand I'm putting you in a bad position, but again, if you say not to, I won't because I'm good for my word that I've said I would accept the position. She said, no. Say, I bless you and you go and interview. It's my privilege at this time to introduce to you the new head coach for the SMSU Lady Bears program, Cheryl Burnett. First of all, I just want to tell everyone I feel very blessed to be here today. I was probably more of a dreamer as I've always been. I believed that you know our staff could go in there and really accomplish some things at Southwest. You know, I, I was thrilled with uh, all of the things she wanted to do because she had the same kind of vision and dream that I had. All coaches know it's very difficult to get point guards and big kids. And in our first class, we got Amy Nelson and Heidi Muller, and then of course the Karen Rapier that uh, we all called at that point the heart and soul, uh, the believer and the worker. She sold a dream to myself, talking about you know that she was trying to bring in certain types of individuals with certain intangibles that would build a program to compete nationally. You learn very quickly it's not easy. There was no media covering women's basketball. The media covering women's basketball was by the name of Larry Hazelrig that would get us as much space in the newspaper as possible and what a huge key that was. Now we did have radio. We did. <laughs> I sent a letter out to, to several radio stations asking them, uh, you know, I gave them several options. She uh, told me about it one night when we were home. She said, let's turn on the radio. I've got a surprise for you. <laughs> we were broadcasting the Lady Bears game without commercials. I wonder what the devil she was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Jane uh, kind of pulled that on, on him, I think. <laughs> well, Cheryl was big on promotions. Uh, and by promotions, I mean getting the word out about her team and trying to get people to the arena. I really have to give an awful lot of credit to Cheryl Burnett because not only did she coach an outstanding level of basketball, she was a pretty good little tub thumper too about uh, coming in and getting some publicity and I tried to, to hold my ground, but you know, if they deserved the coverage, then we were over there. And when they started drawing more people, and that was my only concern, is that you can only judge reader interest mostly by fan interest. And so as the fan interest grew, we started to give them more coverage. After that first year, it pretty much started to explode. What I think is really one of the biggest games in the program's history was that game in late 1989 against Missouri that uh, they one, I think, 71-67. This for a four-point lead. That will put the proverbial nail in the coffin down. Well, the Bears are going to vent 14 years of frustration against the Missouri Lady Tigers. That was the last time the University of Missouri would play us during the Joanne Rutherford era uh, was at Hammond Student Center. Missouri for the first time since 1976. I was at the first game that they raised the blue curtain, and it was a sight. I believe it was 5,003 for a game against Bradley on elementary school day in about 1990. That's, I had tears in my eyes that night. I could tell they had a vision for the program. Um, you know, they, they were building uh, what they hoped to be a national caliber team. Um, you know, and that, that got me pretty excited. If she says we're going to work harder than anybody in the country, that was going to happen. We're going to outplay everybody. We're going to run them into the ground on defense. You know, it just seemed like something that I was wanting to be a part of. I believe you've got to step on the floor every game and believe that you're going to win. And by conceding losses, you're, you're conceding uh, what your dreams are. You hated Cheryl and you loved her. I mean, because she was going to stick it to you. It didn't matter. It, she didn't mind burying you by 60 points. It didn't matter what we did. Before we went into the hands, we were, we were going to be in trouble. Uh, because, her, you know, she, they played such a multitude of defenses, and they changed them so well, and they scrambled out of them so well. And, you know, she's, she's a master at it. It was the defense. It was the press. I mean, you worried about uh, 
uh, not being able to run your offense, about them creating so many turnovers and getting easy buckets. Those coaches are right. I don't know. There's nothing really you can do about it because once it gets going, it's pretty powerful. Uh, I knew the historical si significance of the building. I think that actually drew some people back to come in to watch that game is for them to be able to relive a moment. It was sold out. I sat right across on the front row. My seats were right on the front row, right across from Cheryl's bench. And, you know, if I could have jumped over that railing and somehow got out there to do something, I wouldn't. SIU was definitely the team to beat, so when we had that opportunity to, to win there at Mendo in McDonald Arena, it was, it was very exciting. You know, it, it just was so, so exciting. I, I can still hear it. I can hear it in my ears right now. Our, our whole entire team, first time, didn't have a clue, didn't matter. I mean, it'd be nice to get a home game, but we wanted to win and go as far as we could in the NCAA tournament. To the Mid-East, and uh, seated number one in the Mid-East are the Lady Vols of Tennessee in the final four, six of the ten years this tournament has been played. They'll play the winner of Southwest Missouri State against Tennessee Tech. Well, first, we're very excited to be in the NCAA tournament for the first time, and I believe SMSU history. You know, I, I think Southwest uh, feels pretty good about themselves right now. They have a lot of enthusiasm. They're young. They've got uh, a good record. I would say they have to feel pretty good about themselves at this point going into the game tomorrow night. Our fans were so absolutely incredibly loud. Uh, we did get that first win at home and then uh, I think it's also critical when we were sent to Tennessee and played them a great game and they ended up being the national champions and our players are able to hear uh, Pat Summit brag about how I mean, we were an incredible defensive team. They told us uh, quite frankly that we had our hands full that we were playing a, a defensive basketball team with a lot of similarities of Tennessee. Uh, however, uh, Mickey DeMoss told me that, that this was the most impressive full court defensive basketball team that we were faced all season long. Very, very complimentary, but still, it, I mean, you still look at it as a player of, yeah, that's nice to hear, but we're going there with the goal, we're going there with the mission, we want to beat Tennessee, not just go there and be on the floor with somebody who complimented us for doing a good job in the first round. I mean, we were mad that we didn't win. You know, and that even meant more that I was coaching a group of kids and a team that believed that they should go out and beat a team like that. Well, you ask me right now, and I'm going to plug them in the top ten. Um, <laughs> they're, um, they're good. Um, they play hard. They're committed to their defensive philosophy, and I think um, they disrupt people. If they, they disrupted us, they set a bar and then we all tried to reach it and it made all the rest of us in the conference better and it just made us better as a whole. We're determined because we're like, hey, we've invested four years and I guarantee you there's no one else in the country that's worked harder than us. The players on that team and how they played together, I thought, were really something. <laughs> she made an impact, didn't she? <laughs> She was awesome. I mean, I still tell people to this day, I don't know, I mean, I don't watch college basketball, but you don't see a player like her out there. I mean, she was, what, 6'1", 6'2", maybe, and just so extremely physical. So he was always everywhere, you know? If there was a ball to be picked up, she was going to get it. Plus, I mean, Julie was there, too, at this point. She was a freshman and getting to play with my sis and, you know, everything. It was great. I about cry now. I remember it. I mean, every time it was full, though. And so when that finally happened, that my senior year, we came out onto the court, and the entire arena was filled with people. Yeah. It's like try to get the focus back on the game. I mean, it was really, it's that emotional to me even now. And we actually stopped at half court and waved at everybody with tears in our eyes because we were so appreciative 
that all these people came. And you know, it was a huge moment for me because I dreamed of that for four years. And I, I didn't know if it would ever happen, but I, I saw it in my mind. So when it actually happened, it was just phenomenal. I mean, to look and see that there's hardly any seats open, I mean, that's just all time high. I was on an all time high before the game. And we all dream of of playing in front of packed houses and having that kind of support and, and dream of the day that will come. For us, today was the dream. You know, I think there, was a, there were a lot of things that went along with that game that made it a big game uh, because, because they were SEC, because they were bigger than us, and because we're both in the top 25 and we wanted to show people that we did belong there. You know, I, I kept opening it up and see where we were and not whether or not we were in it. <laughs> One, yeah, we were, it's great, we're in the top 25, but hey, we gotta stay focused, so what? You know, the, and, and Coach Burnett reminded this a lot to us. It doesn't matter what the polls say. You still gotta win and it, it depends on where you are in the end. You gotta prove it. They will await the winner of the 8th versus ninth seed ball game. The 8th seed in the Midwest, Southwest Missouri State. They want the Cheryl and I used to have lots of conversations my six years on the committee. And I used to try to help her understand, don't get hung up on the seed. Don't get hung up on that number. Focus on the draw. They will take on the Kansas Jayhawks out of the Big Eight, 25 and 5. They won the regular season title. They lost the I think because it was Coach Burnett's alma mater and all of us seniors and our whole team, we really were charged up even more. I mean, that's probably the worst thing that could have happened for Kansas because we had extra motivation. We knew, as players, we knew how much it meant to Coach Burnett. Um, you know, so, so you know, we, we wanted to win that. I mean, we wanted to win the game, but we really wanted to win that game for her. That's what this crowd came to see. You know, they kept trying to throw that long pass, and, T and uh, Tanya and Karen kept picking them off back there. And The coach and the team were like, where did they come from? I mean, this is amazing. <laughs> what do we do? Question. I want to talk the least I can. Give us your emotions on beating your former coach, please. <laughs> your favorite. I, I think what I told the players is this win means more to me than they'll ever know. And I'll just leave it at that. I know as a coach that I was just relieved to get over that one and then, you know, now we're sent to one of the top four programs in America. I mean, you have that long to get prepared for the next one. Robbins with a spin move. Out to Howard. Shoots for the tie. Yes! Yes, indeed. She made it to tie it up. Robbins. Still drive into the lane. She tries to scoop at the Muller. Winkfield recovers. Shoots it in. She hits the hoop. The first play we ran of the game was the same play that we ran at the end. You know, if we will, five of us play together, we can beat this team. And I, and I know all of the rest of my teammates felt the same way. So we were on a mission once again. We've often said uh, at that game, what a great game it was. But our fans outworked their fans. However many we want to say was there, I mean, I've heard anywhere from one to 3,000, you know, they probably had five. Ours were by far louder, made more of an impact on the game. Home teams, which are also the higher seeded teams, have won every single one of these second round women's NCAA games. SMS hoping to break the trend. If Tina Robbins had not dove to get a hand on that ball for us to be able to dive and get the recovery, the three-point shot never would have occurred. Robbins with a spin move. Out to Howard. Shoots for the tie. Yes! Yes, indeed! She made it to tie it up! It was actually the same play that Melody hit the three on. You know, Heidi's right there. So, you know, I, I pitch it across to her and Robin, still drive into the lane. She tries to scoop at the Muller. Winkfield recovers. Shoots it in. She hits the hoop. One 
shot. It's no good, and the clock starts, and it runs out, and the Bears have won it 61 to 60 in the most unbelievable game I have ever seen. Uh, and seriously, when it was over, uh, I just remember Heidi. And everybody hugging, it didn't matter who you were hugging, you were hugging anybody and everybody. Yeah, that's what she said, I love that speech. You get to put that on there. <laughs> I would love to. This is a monumental day in the program of Southwest Missouri State University. You know, we've worked very hard, some, some of our players for four years, uh, but really for three years of struggling and fighting to get national respect. And, you know, we felt that at the end of last year and playing the second round at Tennessee and playing them what we thought a very respectable ball game, uh, we still weren't getting the national respect that we would like to get. And then we kept moving up in the polls this year, and I kept telling our players, we haven't proved anything. We have not proved that we're a top 10 team. So you can think that, but don't give yourself a false sense of security until we prove that by beating somebody, and today is the day that we beat somebody. You see UCLA trying to force tempo, and the Lady Bears got back. And Karen Rapier capitalizes, and UCLA didn't. Six to nothing, Lady Bears pitching a shutout at the moment. I mean, we played good teams. We played UCLA, then we played um, Mississippi, and I mean, they, they were both great teams. And yet, they beat the daylights out of both those teams because they were practitioners of an altogether new level of basketball these other teams hadn't seen. They were playing defense, that Cheryl Burnett scramble defense. I have the first question. Billy, did it feel like you were in Springfield most of the night? Well, I, I thought maybe we were in a baseball game. I thought we were, they were going for a shutout when we started, but. We have fans from heaven. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> they are. Hey, so you were out there enough to know, to see all the fans that they brought, yeah. how loud it was, yeah. how much of it managed. My, my greatest concern right now is we're playing a home game for them. We have about 30 people here. They have 1,000. I just hope this does not turn into a home game for them. What you worry about in a game is the, 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 the energy and the enthusiasm that a crowd of people generate for a team. And they seemingly have just fueled off of that all year. Lady Bears fans, and there, there are a multitude of them here on their feet awaiting the first basket by Southwest Missouri State. There it is, Tina Roberts. When the Lady Bears played teams with whom you were not too familiar, that usually meant the Lady Bears were going to win pretty big, and they did. It's like we were the, the Giants at that game. Field down to repair, back to Cecilia with the shot clock at 12. Amy stops, she'll shoot, and she fills it up! Amy hits her first try! Is this storybook or what? Last shot. <laughs> Melody felt it, feels it again. And so it's not to say that they didn't play well, but I think we were just on fire at that point. And it's like, we got two games to go. Nothing's going to get in our way from getting to the final four. Mississippi with possession. Shot is up, and it goes in for Clara Jackson. But Southwest Missouri State has pulled the most incredible feat in the history of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament by defeating Ole Miss. 94 to 71, and one of the greatest moments in the history of Springfield sports. Soon as the buzzer sounded, it's like, praise God, I mean, we are going to the final four. Our mentality is one that, uh, you know, I think Karen phrased it the best, where we've just gone one game at a time. And, you know, we feel that, uh, we should be here, and we're blessed that we are. I'll never forget going onto the floor uh, in L.A. to see Cheryl before the game. And I was so, so proud of her and of what that program had done. I started crying because I was just so happy, like, can you believe it that one of us, a Gateway team, because that was the last year of the Gateway Conference, 
a gateway team is actually at the Final Four. That gives me chills thinking about it. It's, that's, that's humbling, actually. The first semifinal matchup here, the Final Four in Los Angeles. And immediately a turnover as Lisa Lang has trouble handling the tip. Tina Robbins will take the first shot of the day, and she's got a chance for a three-point play. It, it was great. There was nothing like it at the time because the fans back home were so excited. And this one's off to a quick start. Robin, that's a three. Tina and again, that, that game is, it is bittersweet. Uh, it was awesome to be there, to be a part of it. Um, but then we didn't play anywhere near what we were capable of playing. Well, I think that, uh, for one, we're very proud to have been a part of a Final Four. Um, being a historical level for our team from Southwest Missouri State to be a part of, but I think now that uh, we have been a part of it, we also understand that uh, there isn't much satisfaction in just being a part of it. I know, I thought, boy, it's going to happen two more times after this. I wish it would have. You get back, and we could not believe the reception at the airport. <laughs> get just a few. We couldn't get anywhere. It was packed out there. The things you just never expect. I mean, for people to be at the airport waiting for you, it's just... And just every time you would go into the uh, Hammond Student Center for, you know, come out for a game and all those people would be, um, you know, screaming and yelling for you, your team. It just gives you, it gives me goosebumps right now talking about it. Honestly, I think any coach in the country was jealous of what was happening here because it was truly a sixth player. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care where you go. I think the packed Hammonds is the toughest place to play. That does something to players when they're not used to that kind of stuff. A lot of teams come in here already intimidated before they've taken a shot. You could just see those girls looking up in the stands doing one of these going, I don't want this to sound arrogant or anything, but it's like when we play at home with our fans, with our crowd, I mean, we felt like we were unbeatable. Hey, how could you lose with 9,000 people in the stands, you know? Did we ever play there when there weren't 9,000 people? I don't remember those. <laughs> when the ball was thrown up, Cindy Scott is one of the most competitive, intense human beings Totally night and day from what she would be otherwise. My personality when the ball is tossed during during the game was different, let's say. <laughs> they were tough games, but it was always fun. Everybody was always wondering what Cindy was going to do. And I think that our crowd enjoyed it so much. You know, I'll never forget the, the, the game we went to and they were giving out cards where they were singing Get Along Home, Cindy Cindy. That was, that was interesting. And the band was always brutal. Greatest. Greatest college band. Oh, she was a trip. She was fun. I thought she was great for the game. Had a lot of energy, and then one game she came over to us, and I was crushed. She said, do you take any requests? And I said, sure. Why don't you shut up? And I couldn't believe it. Of course, the band went crazy, and I was just like, I was sad. Oh, she was, she was, she could be vicious on the floor. You know, the day an administrator walks into my office and says, how would you like to be on ESPN? You know, of course, the answer is, well, absolutely, okay, well, here's the catch. Fans are jammed into Hammonds in their jammies tonight. We were wanting to get on television, and Patty Viverito, who's the conference commissioner, uh, had a little contact. Those people at ESPN didn't believe us when we told them that if you put Southwest Missouri State on TV any day, any time, there will be a crowd there. The fans in the stands are dressed in pajamas and everybody's just having a blast. It was like it was almost exciting, more exciting than a 7.05 game would be by playing that late at night. Bill Land saying, oh mama, hold on. For the transfer from Oklahoma. Howard with a shovel, oh mama, hold on. I still have nightmares about the 11-3 she hit against us in Hammond's uh, Center and seeing everybody with those three-point cards, waving those three-point cards. Yeah, <laughs> the three cards that day. <laughs> I 
I guess that's what it was all about. I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, you don't think much of about a, what, a 12 inch by 18 inch piece of paper there, but when you've got six or 7,000 of them waving around in the stands, it makes a pretty good impact. Like, no one's ever scored 38 in a game. The, the single game record at the time was 35. She set the single game record and the career record with one shot. Two and a half minutes to go. He's wide open. Here she comes for a three. It is up. It's good. There it is. There it is. Melody Howard is the all-time Lady Bear leader in scoring with her tenth three-pointer of the game. Here she goes again from 28. I wish it would have happened more often. We lost at Southwest Missouri in 91, 92, and 93. Three years in a row, we lost in the conference tournament championship game. Freshman hit the big shot at the end. Yeah, I remember that game. The game had so much meaning to it because it's for a conference championship. The 93 game, we got the ball to Tanya. I mean, Tanya had been carrying us all game long. I know I couldn't hit the broadside of the barn. I don't know about other people, but. Uh, we were trying to go inside to Tanya Bauckham. Uh, she caught, and when she caught, she did a reverse pivot, but two people came to her, and Tanya Davis was wide open. I think we always had a bigger dream in mind, a bigger goal in mind than maybe what some teams do. I think it was something that was very special to, to both Melody and I to, to go through four years and have won a conference championship and a conference tournament championship all four years. Don't know if that's been repeated or not. Success expects success. What those first teams did, that first team that went to the Final Four, those players made it very easy to establish expectations. Players then that came behind them, they expected to win. Tradition does help win games. Year in and year out, there's a player or two that goes down as, you know, I mean, the, the history books now is a lot thicker than it used to be when I started. But I just believe that I could accomplish a Final Four at SMS because I knew Coach Burnett had been to one before. I had one of the athletic administrators say, Rachel, you know that trip to the Final Four was just a fluke, they'll never do it again. And uh, I said, uh, yes, they will. The recruitment of Jackie, of course, was, you know, I, I think that's one that's been talked about a lot. Have her sign a letter, and a letter of intent and sleep on it. If it feels right, send it in. Well, I actually signed the Yukon letter of intent, slept on it, didn't feel right. It wasn't as hard, maybe, as it might seem in the fact that I think Jackie herself always stuck to her guns and stayed loyal to the fact that she wanted to come to, to Southwest Missouri State. Finally, I was able to stand up to everybody and say, hey, I want to go to Southwest Missouri State. Best decision of my life. But She was a challenge to coach. You know, I mean, she, we, we both laugh at it now. Um, you know, if it had to do with defense or giving up the basketball early in her career. Coach Burnett really had to preach and teach me working away from the ball, um, trusting that I'll get it back, going off screen and doing all those things. And that was the biggest adjustment for me. I remember I just as a freshman wanted to take everything off the dribble. I think I drove her crazy my freshman year. It took us three years to figure out our roles. One thing that I knew that I could do that would separate me from other people was play, you know, hard-nosed defense, and I think that's kind of what I've become known for, and probably a little bit of my just in-your-face kind of leadership that I that I do sometimes. I knew that if I wanted to play, you need to be very, you know, versatile, and just I just wanted to play basketball. You know, if they wanted me to play the post, I'll go play the post. If they needed a guard, I'll go play the guard. That group was the most unselfish group that uh, every single one of the kids on that team, I mean, again, from the first player all the way down to uh, a kid that didn't get to play as much, knew what their roles were, embraced their roles, and um, were able to perform at a very high level. You know, I, I wouldn't have scored a point if it wasn't for my teammates, you know, the coaching staff. I mean, they were just incredible support for me.
it's kind of just a blur because it was it was so loud in the gym and there was just so much pressure on that game for some reason. Uh, but amazingly enough, it was just it just was like it was meant to be. That shot was meant to be. Hitting that last second shot was the most special shot for me because it took all five players on that court to pull off that shot. Here's Campbell, she fires one down to Carly. Left side, Jackie, three-pointer. Yes! She hits it! Jackie Styles hits it! Lady Bears win it! At that the was the loudest there. moment in Hannah Shane Center. I mean, I just remember it just erupting. Yes, she wanted to score because she wanted to win. And she wanted to win because she wanted all of us to win, not just herself. She's just that kind of person. Top of the key to Jackie. Jackie, she'll fire up a three. This could be it. It is! That's it right there. Styles has broke the all-time scoring record at SMS. Oh, yeah. I, I never could have imagined um, doing the things that I, I did at SMS. Goes up, fadeaway jumper, short block. Rebound comes down to Carly Deere, long pass down court. This could be it. Jackie right side, layup, good! And there it is! Jackie Stiles, the all-time leading Missouri Valley Conference scorer, a standing goal at the Hammond Student. The, the toughest thing was the, the all-time scoring record, you know, my senior year. Because I, as much as I tried to get away from it, I just couldn't escape. I'll tell you, that year was the most amazing to see what kind of scrutiny, you know, that team was under, what kind of scrutiny Jackie Stiles was under, all the media pressure. We just kind of laughed with it and just kind of rolled. It really wasn't a big deal to us as teammates. And, um, of course, she felt a little bit more pressure. But that was our job to keep that pressure off her and just, you know, concentrate on the game and winning and not so much scoring. Free line jumper on its way. Got it! Here's the steal by Jackie. Here she comes. Nobody in front of her. Layup left side. Good! Jackie Stiles now just a point away. And the fans starting to feel it, Rachel. Jackie three-pointer left side. Yes! Boom! There it is! Jackie Stiles with 20 points, and she is the all-time scoring queen in NCAA history. Big smile on Jackie's face. Exactly right. It was just a total sense of being relieved, just a monkey off my back. I mean, you know. It, it has really been a remarkable thing for me um, to watch this group over time, and I'm really talking in the last four years, of um, handling one player getting a lot of attention. Um, typically, maybe with women, you see some jealousies and, and all of those kinds of things, but with our teams, we really have not. Right now, we have a huge goal on our mind, and that's to try to win the conference championship. So that's where our, all our focus was, and you know that's where it should be. When we found the recruiting class that we came in with, um, yes, there was just something about it. We knew that you know within four years something good was going to happen, or something special was going to happen. And well, I'll tell you this, and no knock against the team that was the 1991-92 season. Um, but we got so tired of hearing about them and how great they were and how awesome they were, and they were. I mean, they were phenomenal, but we were like, wait a second, we can do that too. We really and truly felt like we were deserving and that we had proved ourselves and that we were deserving of a home, you know, a home game. And, and for them to have sent us, I think that just kind of fueled the fire for Mitchum us. Mitchum on the baseline here, three-quarter by Carly. Good. Passes right side. Mitchum, three-pointer on the wing. Yes! One thing I think about is how uh, critical she was in our first-round game in the NCAA tournament my senior year at Toledo. And when she was getting ready to go off the floor, she had no idea that she had scored 40 points. She really and truly didn't. It was so similar to having to beat Iowa at Iowa. I mean, it was just the parallels were almost eerie. It kind of worked out. Everything happens for a reason, and I think it was actually the best trip for us. Rutgers was a great team. They had played in a Final Four the year before, never lost a home game, and to have to go in there. Dribbles to the right, spins, jumper from 12, got it, and that's what you expect out of your senior. Jackie going one-on-one, -on -one. stop, dishes it off to Campbell. She's got a 15-footer on the baseline. Huge basket for Melody Campbell. When we were able to beat them on their home floor, that gave us tremendous confidence. And the Lady Bears are headed to Washington. They knock off number four seed Rutgers. 60 
to 53, and the celebration is on. It's sweet, I sweet. thought we would be ready for Duke. I can remember Jackie's face. She was just so mad. Duke was already looking ahead. I remember getting so upset reading articles. It just fueled the fire that they were, they were talking about the next game. Crossover dribble, three throw line jumper by Styles. Got it. Came into tonight with 967 points. The uh, single season record of 974 held by Cindy Brown of Long Beach State. So Jackie has shattered that record now with 990 points. We didn't put them on a pedestal. We, we looked at them as being young and thought, well, we're the experience here. And hopefully they'll falter like kind of we did for three years being young in the, in the tournament. So. And for our team to play four games, Toledo, Rutgers, Duke and Washington. For those four games, for us to play as well as we could play, and I don't know that I've ever said that as a coach, that I really believe those four games, that particular team played as well as we could play and to do it back to back to back to back. I mean, you have to give that group of kids an incredible amount of uh, respect for that. Headed to the final four at the Sabbath Center in St. Louis. Lady Bears won it over number six, Washington. You know, it's just like we're standing out there with me and is this real? It, I don't think it's hit us yet. I mean, the whole day it's been the longest day. We've just wanted to play, play, play. We've been laying around and our hearts have been racing and we are so excited to actually accomplish the goal and make it to the final four and it being in St. Louis. It's just amazing, and like Jackie said, you know, it couldn't get any better than this. We were lucky that the tournament, the Missouri Valley Conference tournament, was at our home place, so we wouldn't have been home for, you know, five weeks. Uh, the ride there was just unbelievable. I mean, phenomenal. Just, but when you think about it and all the traveling that we did, and I just remember being so exhausted when we got home from Washington. As soon as we were done with the. Uh, we were on our way to the final four. I really just felt sorry for Jackie. We just hit the wall. I mean, it was just fatigue. I mean, we gave it our all. We were the same focus team. We played the same way. We just didn't have it in our legs. And you know, we were the only team that didn't host that was there. And we just ran out of gas. But it hurt so much because we were so close to national championship. I mean, so close. We had a legitimate shot with who was in it and who ended up winning, you know, the other games that we could have had a legitimate shot. I, like I've always said, I would give, I would given up all my contracts, everything for another four years at SMS, because it just nothing compares. That was much crazier than the first one. It is kind of nice to say, isn't it, the first one. You know, a lot of times people ask, well, which, you know, which team would beat the other team? You know, who knows and who cares? <laughs> the next Lady Bears basketball coach, Katie Henderson. Coach Abe. <laughs> Hello, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, but when I went to the Final Four and saw that SMS was there, that's the first time really I struck an interest in him and I was cheering for him the whole time, you know. I really like, you know, Coach Abe when I first met her and I was, I was just like, okay, then this is my new head coach and I'm gonna work as hard for everybody to connect. The transition, there's a lot of question marks, you know, uh, going into the new coach, Coach Abe. You know, she's gonna change the system. Basically, everybody on the floor, I want to be a three-point shooter. And so we recruit kids that way, we recruit shooters, we recruit people that can put the ball in the hole. And I can teach them defense, I can teach them how to make layups, I can teach them how to, you know, do one, two pull-up, you know, shots, but you know, three-point shooting is, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. Overall, it was, it, was, it was probably the best thing for me to get into a running gun offense. In all honesty, if I were to pick a player, I think Jenny Linger's the best kid that's played here. She's the, the most total package player I've seen at SMS. I wanted to win. I, I don't like to fail. And I guess it was kind of a fear of losing and the fact that um, if I put my heart into something, I'm going to do it 100%. I can't take credit for that. That's my husband. He, he said, you need to thank all those people for coming to the game because they keep coming and they keep coming. And it's awesome just being there and having all the fans supporting us. We've earned our spurs. Two Final Fours in the last 13 years or whatever it's been should be the opportunity 
uh, provide opportunity for people to say, hey, there's no, no shame or disgrace losing Missouri State University, formerly SMS, because they've been there. A dream can come true, and that a vision can be realized. Um, that as long as they're willing to work hard and dedicate themselves, dream big. It's one in a million. This place is one in a million. And I, I really just think we are the pioneer of, of creating excitement for women's basketball. It's just a very special place. They forged a trail that nobody thought was ever going to be possible. It's like the best dream that you could have ever dreamed for one moment. And I lived it for 13 years. Absolutely. All my dreams came through. Go lay theirs.